do we hike? Sometimes it's for the peace in nature. The calming serenity that comes with the absence of society. The tranquility of simply existing. And other times, it's all about the challenge. New York City, an urban jungle connected with asphalt and concrete trails. Some of them make up grids, others span rivers. But if you follow the right ones, it'll take you to a not so distant ancient mountainous land made up of sedimentary rock, the Catskills. Tomorrow morning, we would begin our hike of one of the most notoriously difficult trails on the American East Coast, the Devil's Path. It's weird, these DCF tents, they smell a certain way. It's not like a bad smell, but... Mmm, it, uh, it smells is... like packing. Yeah. Right? Skills. We're at a kind of car camping spot. Uh, the whole reason we're staying here overnight so that we can get up bright and early, head to the trailhead, start this hike. That's the plan. We're gonna wake up at 6 in the morning, drive out of here. It's not too far, which is perfect for us. Dan's gonna pick up a lighter because he forgot his. <laughs> and then uh, we're gonna start this 
epic hike. It's supposed to be one of the hardest in the country. Certainly the East Coast. Yeah. It's on a lot of lists. We'll find out. We'll, uh, we'll certainly find out. It's interesting, the, uh, the foliage is uh, kind of holding, holding up for us, so we're kind of excited for that. So hopefully we get some cool colors. Hopefully the hike is not too cold. <laughs> but we will see. Woke up early and began our drive through the scenic Cascos landscape. Along the way, we passed through the Devil's Tombstone, a call along the Devil's Path that we would cross on our second day. Before we begin our hike, Let's take a look at the map. We left our car at the Predator Road Trailhead. Today, the trail would take us over the summits of Indian Head Mountain, Twin Mountain, and Sugarloaf Mountain before descending into Mink Hollow and camping for the night. On our second day, we would leave camp, summit Plateau Mountain, and walk the two mile ridge line before descending into the Devil's Tombstone and then ascending up Hunter Mountain. We would set up a stealth camp on the shoulder of Hunter, then quickly peak bag Hunter itself before sunset. On day three, we would bushwhack to peak bag Southwest Hunter before backtracking and descending into Diamond Notch Falls. We'd then climb our final mountain, West Kill, before hiking the ridgeline and the rest of the way out to Spruceton Road, where we would get picked up and completing the Devil's Path. The beginning of the trail was flat and easy. Soon we came across a strange clearing in the forest. Chairs where you're going. You don't need to bring them. This would be a great place to like watch the stars, and have a fire, you know. This place is a great place to get murdered by a satanic cult. Totally. Totally. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, they got a little altar and everything. Oh yeah, blood altar. Throw some chicken bones in there. Santeria. All right, so we just did the easiest part of the trail, about two miles of relatively flat. And now, now's when the fun begins. All right. Our 1400 foot climb began gradual at first, but soon we were climbing fast. Eventually, the landscape 
turned into the classic moss-covered roots and rocks that make up the famous Catskills landscape. Small cave-like reliefs were carved into the rock and dotted the trail. As we hiked, we began to be engulfed in the clouds, and reaching Sherman's lookout gave us no views. the fog was so dense we could lose sight of each other just a hundred feet down the trail. Soon we arrived at one of the most famous sections of the Dumb's Path, the Vertical Climb. lunch at this uh, stunning view. What time is it? It's like 1230? Almost one. We're uh, almost at the, the peak of uh, Indian Head. Indian Head. Mm -hmm. uh, eating some lunch. Dan's got some wraps. Yeah, wrapping. I got Snickers. I just pounded some Nature Valley bars. Yeah. Got the Snickers uh, for later. Hell yeah. <laughs> It's humid, it's muggy, it's kind of chilly. It's all right hiking weather. Yeah, it's not bad when you're moving. It's drier up here too than lower. The leaves are pretty treacherous. Very slippery. We haven't really done any of the big descents yet. I'm not looking forward to it. Right. We're uh, gonna finish lunch here. Uh, head back on the trail.
many of the Catskill Mountain summits are uneventful and don't even have a sign marking them. With Indian Head, we casually passed its peak and began to descend. Eager for a view, we ventured to find the overlook at the Jimmy Dolan Notch. After a quick break to enjoy the view, we were heading up Twin Mountain. Eventually, we emerged out of the forest to a rewarding view at the southern peak of Twin. After walking the ridge and passing over the Twin Mountain Summit, we began to descend into Pacoy Notch. Come on, buddy! Now in Pacoy Notch, it was time to climb Sugar. After summiting Sugarloaf, it was time to descend and find a camp spot near the Mink Hollow shelter.
right there. We took the campsite. to set up a campfire. Yeah. Get some rejuvenation. Yeah. It's gonna be nice. Oh, for sure. We have more sticks like this size, right? Uh, a couple, are these okay here? Yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. This one's a little, yeah, I was gonna say. I went on a two week road trip, all camping trip, like out west. I'm the only way that we can make coffee in the morning. Cause I didn't know much about like backpacking equipment and like all this like tiny, I just never thought about it. We would have to make a fire every morning and put a percolator, like a camp percolator into the ashes. And then like wait for it to burn. Wow. And then we would drink coffee. So like I got That's very, wild. yeah. I. I've spent many cold mornings like like learning the Zen patience of like I need my coffee. <laughs> Dealing with the shit, you know. Right. I mean there it's very romantic making a fire, making a coffee like over an open fire like that. I mean, of course it tasted like shit, but it's awesome. We sat around the comfort of the fire for several hours, sharing stories before heading to bed. We slept in late, but now it was time for morning chores, breakfast, and coffee. Any sort of like fresh fruit on the trail is like a godsend. 
yeah. So nice to sleep in. Yeah. Dude, I like, I think I woke up initially when the sun started coming up and then I conked out for like another hour and a half, two hours. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Breakfast. Honey buns. Motherfucking donuts. So, we're about to break down camp and uh, start day two. We're heading up that thing. That's our next, that's our next mountain. Plateau. Plateau Mountain. Should be fun. Our climb out of Minkalo up plateau was a challenging 1,200 feet of gain in less than a mile.
Once at the summit of Plateau, we began the two-mile leisure hike along its ridge and admired the vibrant and varied ecosystem that lives on it. This tree along the trail had acquired an impressive and slightly sobering lightning strike scar. Near the end of the ridge, we came to an opening that, to our dismay, was once again sucked in with clouds. We hiked slightly further down the trail and came to Orchard Point, where we noticed the clouds beginning to thin out in a battle with the sun. Eventually the sun went out and the clouds dissipated revealing the autumn landscape. We took in the view and ate some lunch. Now, over the next mile, we would descend 1,600 feet into the Devil's Tombstone.
The vividly colored leaves still barely clung to the trees at the lower elevation, and they floated around us as we hiked. We crossed the road and looked out over Notch Lake. Now in the next mile, we had to climb 1,500 feet up Hunter. Eventually the trail flattened out and we found ourselves in a nice stealth spot to camp. temperature tonight's supposed to get down into the high 20s hopefully just the high 20s we'll see both Dan and I are uh, I'd say pretty well prepared we've got a fire pit here at this campsite but uh, we're gonna try to head up hunter real quick with our packs and uh, just peak bag it and uh, hopefully it won't be too cold fingers crossed Yeah, let's do it. As we hiked back in the dark, 
We grabbed water by the nearby spring, and the moon shined bright, revealing the fast-moving clouds above. Water. Oh, dude, I got up and came back over here four times. What happened? <laughs> I burned my f***ing glove. Oh, jeez, dude. Like, bad? Huh? Bad? Oh, I ruined the glove. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, it's done. Oh, shit. Wow. have a cold finger tomorrow. We enjoyed the fleeting warmth of the fire as the wind blew through our campsite and eventually went to bed. Some of the Catskill Mountains have no official trail to their peak. Southwest Hunter is one of them. We followed a herd path and bushwhacked up to the summit. 
we eventually found the canister that contained the logbook to sign our names. A lonely yellow tree could be seen from the view at Geiger Point. The descent into Diamond Notch would be 1,200 feet over a generous mile and a half. we pass little waterfalls along the way that acted as appetizers to Diamond Notch Falls. Now we had one mountain left to climb, West Kill. Our pace slowed as we climbed the 1,600 feet over two miles. came to Buckridge Lookout for one last glorious view. Yeah, that's the move. Hold on, keep the camera for a second. Yeah. Slum it. Ansel three. Now having summited West Kill, we had to descend 2,000 feet to Spruceton Road and finishing the trail.
you made it this far into the video, I appreciate you, and thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, you can show your support for it by leaving a like, and if you want more content like this video, you can subscribe to the channel. There are more videos on the way. Just really quickly, I started a new job back at the end of last year, and it ate up a lot of my time, and that's part of the reason why it took so long to get this video out. Luckily, things have changed a little bit, and I am not as burdened by time now, and that means videos will come out a lot faster than this one. So, I want to start doing debriefs for these videos. This trip was over the course of three days. Day one was about seven and a half miles and 3,500 feet of elevation gain. Day two was 6.3 miles with about 3,000 feet of elevation gain. Our quick hike up to Hunter was an additional 500 feet of gain and just under two miles there and then an additional two miles back. On day three, we did just over half a mile and an additional 200 feet of elevation gain up to Southwest Hunter. So I didn't show too much of our trek up to Southwest Hunter. And the reason for that is because Southwest Hunter is one of those mountains in the Catskills that doesn't have an official trail up to the top. And that's by design. It's designed to be a bushwhack. It's, it's designed to be an adventure. And that's what Dan and I had to do. We had to follow a herd path and then eventually we had to bushwhack our way to the top of the mountain. And I think it's a slight disservice to make it easy for people by showing how to get up to the top of it, so I decided not to film it. Trust me, if you do it yourself, and you deal with the bullshit that Dan and I dealt with, it's going to be worth it to eventually get to the top, find that logbook, and sign your name. But the rest of day three was about eight and a half miles, 2,000 feet of elevation gain, but about 4,000 feet of elevation loss, which was insane, especially considering the leaves had just fallen and covered the trail and made things super treacherous. And with that said, I would not recommend hiking the Devil's Path when we did it. Late October, with all the leaves, it just doesn't make sense. Save yourself the hassle and hike it in a different time of the year. When the leaves cover the trail, uh, it obscures certain things and makes it easy for you to misstep and roll your ankle. We also hiked off trail accidentally a few times because everything was covered in leaves and we didn't know where to go. So with all this said, is the Devil's Path the hardest trail I've ever hiked? Eh, probably not. Mentally, I think it's one of the most taxing hikes I've ever been on. You have to pay such close attention to where you're stepping on the trail. And as far as intensity of those ups and downs, comparatively to other East Coast trails, it's definitely up there. The intensity of the ascents and descents was made additionally hard by their duration. A lot of the ups and downs on this trail uh, are over a thousand feet, and occur in about a mile, sometimes less than that. Uh, that's a lot of gain and loss one way or the other. Um, the scenery was great, um, but unfortunately because of the weather, we lost the views for about half of the viewpoints along the trail. Getting to those points and not being able to see anything was pretty demoralizing and really put a damper on the mood and I think had we consistently gotten those views I would feel like the trail was a little bit better because of the mental game to it. So by the last day Dan and I were exhausted um, and during that last descent out to uh, our pickup point <laughs> I was I was not happy. Um, I was I was in a dark place, for sure. So in summary, is it tough? Yes. Is it the hardest? I don't think so, but it's definitely on the list of one of the hardest. Quick editor's note, uh, I'm looking through the footage and it sounds like I didn't enjoy myself on the trail. I did. I just think if we had more views on the trail, I would think that the trail isn't as hard 
as what we experience. The lack of views uh, kind of created a demoralizing feeling that made it really easy to feel like things were a lot harder than they actually were. Gear. So I used the Mountain Laurel Designs Burn, which is a frameless pack, and my base weight was 14 pounds. Now, before anyone gets too angry, I understand you're not normally supposed to use a base weight of 14 pounds with a frameless pack. With that said, with food and water and consum other consumables and all that stuff, um, my total pack weight was 23 pounds, which is just safely in the comfort zone for me personally uh, with the burn. With all this said, I'm gonna leave a lighter pack link down in the description if you're interested. So let's go over a few pieces of gear that I really liked from the trip. Um, first up is my pack. This is the Mountain World Designs Burn in DCF. Um, I think it rides really comfortable, uh, for me at least. I really like the hip belt. Um, I find that it distributes not all, but some of the weight to the hips, which makes carrying heavier loads in the low 20 pound range uh, uh, comfortable. But yeah, overall, love this thing. So on our second night, the temperatures dipped below freezing and uh, the forecast leading up to the trip was getting colder and colder. And the, the forecast we were using was in the town of Hunter, which uh, you know, is not up in the mountains. So we had a feeling that it was probably going to be a little bit colder than the forecast of 28 degrees. So that's why I brought this. This is the uh, Western Mountaineering Versalite. It's rated to 10 degrees. Um, my quilt is rated to 30 degrees and I can push it a little bit under 30 degrees, but I wanted to know that I was going to be warm at night. So I brought this and I'm happy I did because the lowest reading I had on my thermometer was 27 degrees and that was in my tent, which makes me think that the temperature got maybe down to 25 degrees, maybe a little bit more. Um, but in any case, I'm glad I brought this, it's warm. It's lightweight, it's about two pounds for a sleeping bag rated to 10 degrees, which is great. And yeah, the Z-Pax Duplex. There is nothing to be said about this tent that hasn't already been said. It's a great tent. Thermarest Neo Air x -Lite. regular size. So this year I actually switched from the large wide version of the X-Lite to the regular size. And the reason why is because I noticed that I get colder on the white pad than I do on the regular pad. I'm not an engineer, I'm not a physicist, but I think part of the reason why the wider pads are colder is because there's more surface space on the outside, allowing cold air to infiltrate. Again. This is just theory on my part and anecdotal with my own personal experience with warmth. I will say on the ultralight subreddit, there are members who agree with me. There's also members who disagree with me. I'm not entirely sure, but what I do know is the regular size is warmer for me. And it's also a couple ounces lighter. So it's kind of a win-win and uh, I'm gonna be taking the regular size x light on all my trips for the future. Prana Stretch Zion Hiking Pants. Uh, I've never been a big fan of hiking pants until I tried these, and uh, these are great. Um, they're comfortable to hike in. They have super awesome pockets that uh, make sense uh, down by your knee. You can roll them up and clasp them. Um, they have a built-in belt system, which is great. Um, overall, these are great, um, and they work really well for me. As you saw in the video, uh, Dan had a bit of a mishap with his gloves that turned 
uh, one of his gloves into partially fingerless. I prefer fingerless gloves, uh, and that's because I find that I like the dexterity that you get when you're doing like camp chores and stuff like that. These ones are specifically from Montbell. They're the Shami's fingerless gloves. Um, I find when they are paired with these uh, Montbell shell mittens, I find I can take them down into the 20s and be comfortable. And these, the pair of these uh, shell mittens is 0.4 ounces, which is, you know, ridiculously light. But they add so much warmth, especially when you couple them with some regular gloves. Um, yeah, love these. So the next video is going to be back in the Catskills. Uh, we're going on the escarpment trail in about 48 hours after this video comes out. So look forward to that and thank you again for watching.